Who's the other 50? Jiwa from, 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 uh, oh, hi, Dims. Um, just to answer Hippie's question, it's uh, Nadir Jiwa from VMware. OK, uh, I'm back. Uh, I have a new laptop, so I have to go hunt the old laptop down to get the password. Anyway, we are recording. Uh, today is March 11th. This is the SIG Architecture meeting. And welcome, everybody. Um, so let me open up the agenda. And the first thing on the agenda today is uh, a revised API reference discussion from Tim and Irvifa. Uh, I don't see Irvifa here. Uh, Tim, take it away. Hello, folks. So yeah, I'm come here from SIGDOCS, where we want to put up a new API reference. And uh, I'm going to try screen sharing. I've got permission. I don't have permission. Tim, I think you're a little too quiet for folks to hear. Yeah, Tim, it sounds like you're you're being picked up maybe by the mic on your or the you know the input on your laptop instead of like. Okay, so Zoom reset the volume of my mic. I don't know what it should be. Try this. How's this? Oh, much better. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I just saw that Zoom put it to zero, and I was like, let's pick a number. Sorry about that, people. <laughs> uh, you are a co-host now. Please go ahead. Cool, right. Uh, so yeah, back to the topic at hand. Uh, now I have to wait for the computer to catch up. But yes, I'm going to screen share. And I'm going to talk about some different API references. So uh, this that you see here is the API reference that I'm talking about. It is the new Kubernetes API reference. Um, I'll be happy to try and answer questions on that. I want to get feedback from especially SIG architecture on how we're going to adopt this and what we need to do before that happens. To remind people, there is an old API reference. Uh, let's go up back one more. Oh, no, sorry. Now I can't find the, oh, <laughs> OK. Uh, this is the API reference that is sort of canonical. Uh, I guess a lot of people recognize that. We update this in SIGDOCS during a release time. It is a big, long page. And there are no links to the rest of the documentation, which is a bit of a drawback. Uh, and hence, uh, Philippe Martin did some pretty good work uh, for the um, season of docs to generate the, uh, the API that you see uh, illustrated here. Uh, and this is generated documentation. The old API reference is generated. You can find, for example, pod in here. Uh, and in the new API, pod is here. So what I want to get from SIG Architecture is an understanding of what's the minimum viable product to use this new API reference that links to everything else and uses Doxy. Behind the scenes, this is Markdown generated from Golang code and um, I guess it uses the open API uh, endpoint. Uh, I don't actually know how the generation works. It works great. Uh, and take this away. So what do we need to do? Um, so Tim, you mentioned that there was a, a bunch of feedback from Jordan. Um, was uh -huh. uh, some of that already rolled into uh, what you're showing us? Um, so Jordan's, I, I mean, to, to summarize Jordan's feedback, which I, I haven't got the, uh, the link for, um, I think it was concerns about URLs. Uh, so let me, let me point out one of the challenges here. So I'm going to show two other um, API references related to Kubernetes uh, and how they do URLs. And I, I want to get people's uh, views, um, not just on that, but on other things, uh, to make sure that we've captured the important details. So uh, this is the uh, OKD, which is based on Kubernetes API reference. And if I jump into, what shall I pick, a resource quota, which is part of um, Kubernetes inherited into OKD, the URL is like this. And there is a relationship between the, um, the URLs that you'd see in the API. They're right on the page. And there is a relationship between those and the documentation URL. Uh, the existing API reference isn't really clear on like the URL bit, you see. Like if you look at pod here, it doesn't mention that the slash API anything that's not shown. Um, 
but that might be a really important thing to to incorporate and there is as i say like a relationship between a uh, resource quota here and the fact that it's core and it being slash api api slash v1 slash resource quotas i'm also going to quickly show how kubevert shows that quantity um i don't know what you call these to be honest like there's probably a term for it but quantity is not an api you can't kubectl will create a quantity but it's a thing that is used in in api definitions and it's useful to have this page available in the um you know in the api so that in the api reference you can understand what a quantity is and if i want to tell people oh you need to use a quantity there uh, i can tell people a url of what i mean so i guess what should i do to uh, what do i need to do to move this forward uh, how can i canvas more opinions um, and make sure that we're capturing all the points of work to fix Uh, the floor is open. Uh, does anybody want to chime in? Uh, I guess, Tim, I had a question. I, I'm less, um, um, I guess my first question is like, is, is what, nothing stops incremental improvement, right? So like, um, uh, what you showed here comparing Qvert community doc or um, uh, OpenShift doc, like that all seems like stuff that could be evolved later, I guess. Was any of the feedback you got blocking? So one of the challenges is around, if you're running say uh, the, the CLI kubectl and uh, you are looking at the help for something, kubectl will show you links to pages so I had a PR merged recently to link from the help for cron job to you know the cron job concept page uh, and a particular fragment of it, and that's fine for linking to sort of a page about cron job because uh, let me just actually clarify what I mean by the cron job page. I mean the cron job concept page in uh, in workloads. So it'll be I took I put a bit of PR in so that the um, the relevant bit of the Cron job API links here for uh, additional details uh, here specifically. Not a problem. That's a stable URL. We have we're going to make commitments that if we change that URL, there'll be a redirect. Trouble is that most of the links now look like this, and we don't really want to keep this page. Like, I don't want to break everyone's links, and I also don't want to keep this page. So it's squaring that circle that I want help with. Okay. Um, so my feeling, uh, Tim, is um, let's come up with, uh, we can not dig through, do we have enough information on how, how many times a page got hit? Um, I think so we have this, it for the website, but I don't know if it's for the docs too. The reference, the, this reference does not take part in Google an Analytics as far as I know, uh, because it's, uh, it's a bit special. Right. Um, so not really for this. I guess we could we could start capturing Google Analytics, which might be useful. But I suspect I would really like to get this done before those Understood. statistics would be useful. Right. So that was one uh, angle of thinking. The other angle of thinking was like uh, how many references in our existing, uh, you know, Kubernetes in, in, in K slash Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, how many references do we will we have to fix? Will we have time to fix it before uh, the 121 release? Okay. Well, I, I think there's a reason why I don't think that's relevant, which is old releases, because not many people will adopt 1.21. Mm -hmm. Like, I know people who are running kubectl like 1.14, and right. just for the supported versions, like I want to make sure that all of any time someone does kubectl help and they're running any supported version of kubectl, that they they don't just see a broken link. We've got to do better than that. Okay. I don't know what SIG architecture, and it, it is, I think, SIG architecture is probably the best SIG to comment on, like what level of breakage is too much and what's the what's the minimum and what's the right, you know, what's the, 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 the sweet spot? Right. Um, so uh, the other way to look at it is, um, would we be able to keep uh, both around uh, to transition? Uh, 
Starfleet? So, yeah, so that's a good question. These are live now. Uh, you are seeing the live Kubernetes website. Right. Now, this is behind a robots.txt. Mm -hmm. um, ask me in the chat if you don't know what those are, that is, but it's, it's a simple right. way of blocking things from crawlers. This is not blocked from robots.txt because that would be that would be bad. Uh, we could swap that round, um, but there's different options, and that's why I'm here for this discussion because it's not a straightforward answer. So, which one would you like to do? Uh, if you ask me, I would just say open the robot dot text and like let it crawl, right? Um, and then um, maybe in the old uh, pages, uh, we will throw up a banner or something um, for all the pages saying this is going away. Um, so please uh, go to this uh, other new link as the base for the documentation from now on. Let it run for um, one cycle and then rip out the old one. Is that doable? So I'm not positive if it's doable or not. My question, I guess, is just, is there a reason we can't do redirects? Like. I don't know if you want to use something along the lines of an aliases or whatever, however it's implemented on the internals, but like ideally we would have pages that don't exist anymore, but there is a page that people should be looking at, just have it redirect, right? Like, is there a reason we can't do that? And we're talking about deprecating pages? I think there is just too many of them <laughs> uh, and it might not be able, we might not be able to generate it, uh, generate all the uh, redirects by hand Tim? Well, so yeah, so Jordan's had some good feedback on, on this. Um, and in a way, one of the problems with redirecting is that there are too few pages. So this is a fragment identifier, but if I cut it off. It goes to the top. You have one page. So redirects on the web are typically done at the, you know, the resource level, not on fragment identifiers. Now, yeah. That's essentially, the, the, that makes it hard. It doesn't make it impossible. We could maybe do something with JavaScript. We could have a deprecated page that tries to help. And you know, like that's, that's maybe what you're suggesting, Rujan. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is like, usually if people are clicking on an old link, they'll be forgiving of the fact if it doesn't take them to exactly what they want. If it takes them to something that's close and maybe has a search button, you know, like the page that you're going to, uh, has moved to this general area, this may be the right direction for you or search over here. I don't know, something like that, just spitballing here. But when I've dealt with this sort of thing before, it's been a lot of, mm -hmm. you're not gonna be able to do a perfect one-to-one -one mapping, but people are usually pretty forgiving as long as the link doesn't go nowhere. Okay, right. cool. Um, that, thank you very much, Bridget. Uh, hippie, go for it. Uh, on the receiving side of the redirect, um, we could look at the refer URL, and I think that does include the uh, the sub object, so that the, it could possibly be like you're saying in JavaScript, some type of um, this is likely what you were looking for. So we use a CDN. Yeah, I don't know if refer is available to JavaScript code. Uh, that is not my area of, of strength. But we use a CDN to serve this, so we don't do any server side processing um, during serving pages. Right there. Yeah. So. Uh, if you ask me, Tim, switch switch on the robots and do what you can to help people uh, who who might uh, who might land in a page that is going to go away, and keep the old site around for a cycle. Okay, uh, with a deprecation page afterwards. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, I'm new to this. Sig. How do people uh, put, do, do notes? Is it like inline in the agenda or what? Yeah, you can just. Uh, okay. Yep. I'll, I'll, when I've like done my piece, I'll, I'll, I'll put some notes in the agenda based on what I'm uh, jotting down. Um, right. You're thinking like, but basically, um, uh, Jim, as you're saying, like one cycle. Yep, one cycle. Uh, no, like one thing I'm glad you didn't say is let's have a cap and, and what have you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but like this was your chance to ask. Um, <laughs> uh oh, I gave up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess um, I think that Jordan's feedback was that the, let me show you again, the, the new URLs. The new URLs are a bit 
iffy, um, it's a strong word, but problematic because <laughs> you cannot predict this part of the URL uh, based on knowing the name of the, let me pick a particular thing. So network policy, you don't know that network is under say, uh, right. network policy is under policies or, or, or not network. You can't, it's not linked to the SIG and it's not link, linked to the API path. So if I find uh, network policy in these other references, the URL is much more predictable and that unpredictability was a worry. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that feedback stands. And what I think here is like, I trust you as a SIG to know what to do right for your, uh, you know, consumers. So uh, you uh, like get feedback from whoever you can do whatever you can and ship it. Yeah. So Bridget asked a question about what, why is this a concern? And I think it's around, if you have this kind of mechanical grouping, then it's, it's kind of unarguable. Um, but um, for the, uh, when, when the grouping is, a, you know, this is curated. Um, and I think what's, what's probably the compromise is that we have, oops, um, yeah, we have this kind of curated page, but the URLs that things go to have that, um, I'm going to borrow um, Qbert, um, Qbert style, um, no, I'm going to borrow OKD, OKD style predictable URLs. Uh, and I'll wrap up there if there's no more questions or comments. I had a question around uh, your current detection of feature flags, uh, both the APIs and uh, operations resources hidden behind them and the alpha detection. beta and the detection state of that. Uh, and I also dropped a link to uh, uh, Kep, I believe for Nikita, who has um, some adding some data that we need this as part of the performance operations. And we have done a lot of different approaches to trying to generate in an in a automated way, knowing what is supposed to be fully released and alpha and beta. And it's not, we haven't found a straightforward way. So I'd love to hear the, the approach that you've had and also make sure that we're all aware of, of this. Sure, well, the, I mean, the approach SIG docs take is that if a SIG graduates a feature to, to beta or GA, it's that SIG's responsibility to manually update the docs. But having some automation on this would be like, I know exactly how to write the code to integrate with that, um, you know, um, list of feature flags and status once it's something to consume. Where within the docs, because maybe we could use this information as well, where do the, uh, do the docs get updated? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. I, I thought this was going to automate a generation. But you're also saying there's a play. Find, Where is that uh, uh, the magic connection point? Um, the feature gates page. So um, here is your table. This is a markdown table of feature gates. And if you're graduating a feature, you're going to change this. And if you're graduating to stable, you're going to move it to uh, to this. And none of that is generated. Like, oh, give us some JSON, give good. us some YAML, and we will generate it. I, I will personally be like well into doing that. Lovely to find this, Tim. Thank you. Okay, Tim, do you have everything you need? Yes, thank you. I'll, I will update the agenda. Okay, thanks a lot, Tim. Tim. Okay, next up is Jack. Jack Francis, please take it away. Hey, folks. I will be very brief. Uh, I'm kind of on a disclaimer roadshow at this point. Um, so a lot of folks in this meeting have been very helpful um, and resilient this week as Lockie and myself have pestered them relentlessly about the effects of the exec probe timeout feature gate. So a little bit of background. In um, the 120 release cycle, uh, exec probe timeouts were finally fixed definitively, and so they are now respected. But as a, um, a kind of carrot to folks who are using exec probes with long timeouts historically, a feature gate was shipped with that that allows folks to essentially opt out of that fixed behavior so that um, you know, Kubernetes service providers and folks can provide their customers maybe more time to communicate that this is effectively uh, a functional change with the adoption of 120. So that background being, um, established what Lockie and I have been working to do this week is 
to develop a little bit more formality about when we're going to retire that feature gate. So that work um, has largely been done. I'm gonna paste an issue in the chat here. This is my issue. So if the canonical issue ends up being somewhere else, I'll make sure that this um, has a link to it. Uh, the to-do item for us going forward is to develop a consensus as a community when we're gonna officially retire this feature gate. Um, so if you have a vested interest in that feature gate being retired sooner or later, um, feel free to hop in and participate. And then one further point is that we have uh, reverted a recent change that promoted um, the behaviors of exec probe timeout, um, uh, the fix to conformance test. We reverted that, so that's no longer a conformance test. And um, anybody here who can better clarify this uh, in terms of policy than me, feel free to hop in. But basically, we aren't able to decompose, uh, we're not able to, uh, within the conformance test, be super sensitive to a feature gate being on or off. And so what this means is that folks who are opting into that feature, opting out of the fix by opting out of the feature gate, I know that sounds confusing, but exec probe timeout equals false is the kind of uh, keep the old behavior gesture. So if you're in that scenario in your cluster, you're gonna fail conformance um, if we run those tests. So those tests have been removed. And the uh, the agreement at this point is that when that feature gate is officially retired, then we'll re-add that as a conformance test. Uh, I would like to ask Andrew if he had any feedback after all the discussions that went on here. Andrew, Saikim. Um, no, I don't. Um, have much to add. Um, yeah, like we, we kind of anticipated that this change could be disruptive and we kind of said that it was worth biting the bullet because basically Kubelet was ignoring, you know, a V1 API field. Um, yeah, I, it's unfortunate, like, yeah, like the whole conformance thing, I think that makes sense, right? Like a lot of people want to, or a lot of platforms want to keep the behavior off for good reason and doing that breaks conformance. Um, which is unfortunate, but yeah, like I, I think our decision to like push the feature, like keep the feature gate on or keep the feature gate as long as we need to so people can continue to opt out and removing the conformance um, test uh, seems like a reasonable thing to do right now. Um, so Andrew, you still have the pen on the cap and um, you will volunteer to put, put uh, things back the way it should be down the road? Sure, yeah. When do we think is a reasonable time or re reasonable release to re-add the conformance test? Um, so goes back to Lucky and Jack, how much time do you need given what you know now uh, than, than one week ago? I, I guess whenever we remove the feature gate, right? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So I'll actually, I'll make things slightly more complicated. I was, I'm chatting with Lucky in the background saying, I'm not gonna make things complicated, but now with this question, I will. So I've spent a lot of time this week testing really the boundaries of these particular edge cases. And one thing I've discovered in, in the Azure tests that I've done, so this is Azure specific plus a very particular build of container D, but the, the side effects are actually nastier if you're running container D. And so that, uh, knowing that would um, suggest that we would wanna accelerate disabling this feature gate to just basically force customers to get on the new fixed behavior. Because we do have some, you know, in Azure AKS and other Kubernetes sort of DIY scenarios, there are lots of folks using Container D, as you can imagine. So for those, it's harder to communicate when you have all this sort of split brain messaging. Like, okay, if you're on Container D, definitely do this. If you're on Docker, we're going to protect you for four future releases. So I think to answer your question simply, Dims, I would probably guess like 120 at the end of, we'll go through 122 and then starting with 123, we'll force people to take it off that. But I, I think we should discuss that, you know, a little bit more formally than just yeah, on top of my brain uh, in a cigar cap. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, not not to put you on the spot there. Uh, Derek, are you uh, uncloaked? Please go ahead. Uh, no, I guess um, as we talked in Signode, like um, as a community, we sometimes make choices that seem fine, and then. Um, uh, it can sometimes give heartburn on people to think that we're really dogmatic on things when we're really open to just feedback. So I wanted to thank uh, Lockie and, and uh, team to uh, sharing their feedback. Um, the, the, 
I think the retro we have here is like, a, this probably won't be the first time we get a bug um, or have an unintended side effect. And um, I'm not sure like if there's an easy way to, uh, when we promote something to conformance, check if its behavior is gated on a feature gate or not. Um, I think like in this case, like the feature gate had the name exec probe and the test case had the name exec probe that like a linter of some kind that said, uh, are you sure? Like we could have had the, the obvious of like, oh, maybe we, we want to think about that. I'm not sure if that's good enough going forward, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, that, that was the only like concrete, like what do we do to avoid this again in the future? Cause there's probably other aspects that we're not yet aware of that either we didn't implement as we desired or have weird edge cases. Um, and this won't be the only time. I think we're already doing some of the work that's gonna help, right? Making sure that we've got the cry run times, for example, in the, in the CICD. Thank, thanks to uh, Dems for you know pulling some stuff in. But yeah, we, we were making too many PR changes thinking that, you know, that ah, this, this looks like a good fix. But then, then it's like, oh, well, you know, all these other runtimes had a different opinion of how that should be implemented. And, and yeah, you can fix Docker Shim, but that doesn't fix container D and cryo right away, right? So. Yeah, and I think with cryo, I know Mernal had looked at this and we talked about it. Like there's a different side effect that happens here, but there is a general issue on API review we should think about going forward, which is where someone is doing something via gRPC. We, we need to establish as a project, maybe an upper bound on a gRPC timeout. Um, yep. <laughs> and so these probes, like right now, you could set a value that's larger than the gRPC timeout and we won't respect that either. Um, so there's gonna be, I, yep. I don't know the right time that we wanna establish on that for a project, but. Um, Wait. Certainly before 122, because we, we've got some, some features we'd like to see come in for short-lived pods that are going to need even smaller timeouts. So this kind of issue is going to become even you know, harder to, you know, to analyze. Um, you got a lot of customers out there using probe, probe timeouts and you know, probe delays and, and manually hitting the C advisor, and that's probably not what you want, right? Yeah, um, uh, yeah and I don't know if... Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, and I don't know if we want to be going into solutioning um, in this meeting, but like I'd be more than happy to write uh, an admission webhook or admission control in API server that like can expand the default probe timeout for exec probes if the feature gate is on or something along those lines. Like, cause we can't change the default timeout for probes because that would extend the default timeout for other types of probes, but I think right. if we can add an emission control just for exact probe and expand it to like five seconds or something to make this issue a little easier to transition into, like I'd be more than happy to do that. Yeah, not trying to do the solution either, but what we would do is add a new field and the new field would say, you know, if you're using the milliseconds now, you know, that that's that's overriding the prior field, but we'd, we'd have to talk about it in detail. Okay, Hippie has been patient. Uh, please go ahead, Hippie. Uh, one of the things we've been really looking forward to with the conformance program is the ability to look at in two different places for feature flags and uh, and uh, knowing which APIs operations and which um, kinds and and, uh, and the resources are behind those flags. Um, what we haven't done yet with that information is make decisions within the conformance test themselves, and that's something we might want to look at. We talked pretty heavily over the years around having different um, profiles or something where, where uh, you get different levels. Um, but I think on this case where we have something that we're trying to, to uh, do some testing around, we might be able to use feature flags themselves to, as a conformance. If these features are enabled, then we want to go ahead and ensure that we test whether the, like at, it, you test both cases. <laughs> If it's off, make sure it's off. If it's on, make sure it's on. And that is a more uh, uh, inclusive test for everybody's preferences that the uh, Kubernetes API responds as designed and expected. Matrix for the win. Okay, uh, Clayton, did you have anything to chime in because you were in the, uh, some of these discussions, especially around conformance? Mm -hmm. 
going once, going twice. He can't find his unmute button. <laughs> his cat's probably, uh, wow. No worries. I tried. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, any last word, uh, Jack? Oh, just to second what Derek mentioned earlier. Um, in fact, everyone has been extremely flexible in this. I think the uh, initial engagement was extremely sort of emergent, like day before release. Um, so if there are any, any feelings there that things weren't flexible, that was always obvious that we discovered this way too late to expect any changes. So it's been actually extremely positive and encouraging. Yeah, uh, let me turn this around to like a call for help on the conformance uh, sub project. So uh, there is well-known promotions that happen du uh, during um, a cycle. And if folks can look out at least for that promotions uh, PR and chime in whether with a thumbs up or a thumbs down, that will seriously help us uh, because uh, right now, there's only a few of us taking decisions. We would like more eyes on it so that we can catch more uh, such potential issues. Um, great. I'll follow up with, I'm lucky and I can follow up with folks on our side. We've got folks working on conformance. So that's a great suggestion. Um, I, I would love to see, uh, we have a two week stoke time uh, that we require for the test before we promote. I would think it'd be lovely that uh, at the two week mark prior, to the, to the merge, we go ahead and create that promotion PR so that that discussion has two weeks of conversation and anybody that's part of the conformance team and, and if people that are interested can have those two weeks to talk about the, the, the correctness or the other things around that being, because it's not just flakiness. That, that two week time is for our community to have a voice together as to whether this is what we want the cloud to look like. Um, uh, Hippie, maybe uh, another label called uh... Uh, promotion of some kind uh, will help. Uh, the area slash conformance is uh, too noisy at this point. So uh, please think of something else as well. I'll take an action item to create a, um, a, a API promotion um, uh, flag or um, label and um, make sure that that um, somehow, maybe not automation yet, but just it needs two weeks conversation. Uh, uh, lucky. Yeah, I, I like uh, what you're saying here, Hippie and, and Dims. Jack, we should like pull that into our test infrastructure once that PR, uh, PR's up so we can get early signal because the net effect here was we had to choose between either being conformant in the service, which we'd made a commitment, or breaking customers. So when I saw Jack this email, across, I'm, I'm like, no, 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 we got to go upstream and get this fixed. I don't think the intent here was to have non-conformance at the risk of breaking workloads. Right. Um, so we should like pull, if we can automate and get signal off that early PR, you know, Jack kind of has infrastructure here to test it across all versions. So we should make sure we pull it in, autom automate it. So we get really early signal of how that's going to look in situational environments. Well, in fact, that's actually what happened. We just, we're just doing it in the super sloppy running around with our heads cut off kind of way, because the folks on our side did notice this, this change in conformance signal roughly two weeks ago. So. We're here because some totally ad hoc process of human beings kicked off. So next time, we'll be it'll be much more seamless, hopefully. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks a lot for engaging with everybody and um, you know coming to a conclusion here. Uh, any any last thoughts? Anybody else? Sergey, um, Clayton? Nope. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next. Uh, Laurie, uh, we have 19 minutes. Is that enough for you, Laurie? Uh, oh, yeah, more than enough. Okay. Yeah, no, this is a quick. Um, uh, so basically, yeah, I have two topics. The first one is uh, about the enhancements process. So uh, I'm a sub project co owner, but I have trouble understanding the process. So I made a diagram and a mirror board. And if you want to pop that up just to show people um, what. Laurie, like. let me let me give you the control okay. and you can do sure. that. Okay. Um, um Laurie more my co-host. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Sharing. All right, so I 
took the documentation and the different outstanding GitHub issues and pull requests that I found and created this diagram to show the process in the different stages. And as you can see, it's pretty extensive. Um, I've also teased out some of the um, stages that are, oh, oh, I froze for a second. Um, I've already uh, also teased out the steps for the PRR here, which um, those are pretty clear and uh, now in use. And then uh, trying to establish the timeline and how these steps all fit. So we've gotten feedback that the process is getting heavy, that it's hard to follow, that there's lots of steps. And just making this diagram, if you click in um, closer, you know, there's there's all the time this, but there's this one particular case where this is happening. And so when we have a lot of those, that's just a lot of context switching, things for people to remember, and subsequently things for people to forget. So we've been talking around this diagram now since last week in the enhancement subproject to see where we can remove pain points, to see where we can simplify and where we need to simplify. Um, the immediate to do, which I've noted in the agenda, is we want to take an action around this step and actually clear up like what level of process and review do we need to send a thing through to get it um, in a release. Uh, we have a lot of things going to the release team for review. Maybe all of those things don't need to go to the release team for review. And so Stephen had actually proposed this um, issue, and there's a discussion now forming there about how we could classify um, different types of CAPS to then automate how we send different CAPS through these different layers of the process. So that discussion is um, was um, quite uh, active last night and I shared the Slack thread where you can see the comments and feel free to jump in on that if you'd like. But basically what I'm asking this group to do is if you could take a look at this mirror board and share your feedback about the process, where it could be improved, where it's not working for you, where you think you would abolish steps, get rid of things completely or, or tighten up. Whatever feedback you have, um, please share that in the Slack channel because I'm biased, but I think this is an incredibly important process. This is how we get feature development and out the door, uh, features out the door and if this is what we're asking people to do, I think we need to ask ourselves, is, is, this, real, is this realistic if we add any more steps, if it gets more complex? Uh, so Laurie, um, it's okay for you all to have a Slack channel to do this, uh, you mm -hmm. know, our mailing list, mm -hmm. but please file a cap to refine the process. Um, that is definitely something that I would ask uh, you all to do and mm -hmm. not uh, take a decision just because Somebody no, showed yeah. a Slack thread on a specific day and other people were not there. Yeah. I think it's the first step is just what is the proposed change? Right. And, and that discussion. Do, yeah. Fair. You do have like a natural set of people who uh, this time signed up for the enhancements process in the various six. Those mm -hmm. would be your first line of uh, people who would give you feedback on whether this worked the cycle uh, because they opted in. And so that would be the first set of people that you need to poke at. And the second set of people is like the people who didn't sign in and sign up for the process. Like they might, uh, they might not have signed up for various reasons. So go back and uh, check with them as well. Uh, and then when you collect the feedback and uh, put together a plan, come back here and we can uh, go through it one more time. Uh, when you're talking about people opting into the process, who are you referring to? Uh, the six, so this time in the enhancements team, uh, six were allowed to opt into the enhancements process. Oh, okay. To that, yeah, I was talking about that one. Okay, okay, because um, we've also had a couple of folks opt in to provide feedback as users of the process. So that would be Alana Hashman from Six Node and Instrumentation and Tim Hawken. So we're getting some good feedback, user feedback from them. That's what I'm bringing this topic for like, this is what you, user feedback that I would like to collect from as many people as possible. Right. We all have different perspectives and experience levels with this process. So the more feedback we have, the better informed our decisions will be. But if you want to propose actual ideas to the process, that's also welcome. 
and we we consider that and discuss that in the channel and then make that cap recommendation right does that uh, sound like what you're yeah suggesting? Uh, every, yeah everybody who is a consumer of this process wear your individual hat go uh, go talk to laurie and uh, other folks in the enhancements and uh, re refine the proposal and then write it up and then come back yeah okay yeah so does anybody have any questions or I'll move on to the next topic? One last question I had is, uh, mm -hmm. did you already run this through the chairs and leads uh, um, call, Laurie? Not, I've shown the diagram, but because it's still being formed, you know, it's the same ask. Um, if you have any input as a user, or if you have suggestions, please share. But I haven't given any official presentation just because the discussion is quite lively at the moment we haven't resolved any proposed changes yet and i think this is the first one because from this step we can then look at cascading simplicity right so it's just here's what's going on right now please take a look um what are you what's unclear what's confusing what's painful based on your experience just at that level right now uh thanks laurie uh, Derek, did you have anything you wanted to add here? Uh, Derek? No, no, yeah. Nothing specific. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Laurie, was, did you want to talk about the process and workflow guide? Yeah. Sure, yeah, I just wanted to, it's another show and tell. Yeah, please go so, for it. <laughs> so, so this is a process and workflow guide that I've spun up, PR, spun up a PR about. And this takes all of the input that I've gotten from various SIGs in the past year about how they are managing their processes and workflow, what's working for them, um, and then detailed information about how they're um, executing on these process improvements and, and processes. And it's a compilation of all of that into a guide for any other SIG chair or lead or motivated contributor to take a look at and adapt to help their own SIGs. So um, it's currently being reviewed. Um, some of this is from what we've done in SIG release as well. Uh, I'm a program manager by trade. And so this is what I, this kind of weird things I enjoy. But um, also SIG node has a lot of input here now from Alana's work there in running triage in um, managing the cat backlog and um, some of the other uh, activities. Uh, my ask here is if you would like to consider using this guide in your own SIG, please feel free to reach out in the chairs and leads channel. I have posted there in Slack a thread and some folks are commenting there. I've offered in the chairs and leads meeting to have some small breakout groups with people who would like to run through their process issues and we can talk about them and then devise some solutions that are customized to their needs. So um, I think you know you, every process needs to be different for every team and group. So that's what we'll take care of there. And I have some interest in project, road, uh, project board setup and road mapping. So road mapping and planning your CAPS backlog and what you wanna achieve in future release cycles. And I will mention that from this conversation, there has spun up another side conversation about how we could create a Kubernetes roadmap like what would be the obstacles to that? Um, are there SIGs who would participate in that today if that opportunity was present? Um, a SIG road, a Kubernetes roadmap being like, here are the caps we are planning for the next few cycles. And you know here are the outcomes we wanna see and putting all of that together um, from the participating SIGs and then publishing that for users and contributors to understand the direction that their groups are taking and then that the overall project are taking. And then we could also use that roadmap to see if there might be compatible goals that we could simplify or if there are competing goals that we need to help drive alignment around. I will, uh, by the way, I will create a diagram. Oh, sorry, is somebody speaking? That was me. Okay, sorry, feedback. Um, I will create a, a diagram that will be a simplified version of this because uh, it's quite long, but it will just give you the highlights and then you can read further if you want more detailed information. 
I like it. You're, so you're saying you'll give us the cloud native trail map to go with the landscape. <laughs> yes, that's a great way to, to describe it. <laughs> and some trail mix as well. Yeah, I mean, the main thing I see here, Laurie, is like we need more of you uh, across <laughs> the thing. So right. whatever you can do to make it happen. Well, not just our things, like, you know, Container D could use uh, one of you as well. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> uh, so, uh, so uh, let's, uh, you know, let's find more people <laughs> uh, and coach them, right? And uh, people who are interested in this, um, you know, we, we should try to train them in, in, uh, in what you're putting, through, putting together here and uh, let them lose in various things and, uh, you know, make things better uh, overall. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there are SIG chairs and tech leads that are carrying quite heavy workloads. But there are also people like me, they don't necessarily need to be program managers, but they're technical contributors who also really enjoy this stuff. So if we can actually empower them to do this work, it frees up chairs and tech leads to focus on strategy and architecture vision, and then you have less that you have to carry. Um, so Alana Hashman is actually going to be uh, onboarding chair, or she's talking to folks about onboarding chairs and tech leads um, through mentoring. And this um, this could be a compatible part of that is to also help with the process side of things so that um, people have every aspect covered. So from the SIG architecture side, I would say, uh, let's try to uh, hit all, all the different sub projects and uh, yeah, see if we can get get something like this going uh, definitely in you know hippie is here so conformance for sure uh, mm -hmm. code organization it's just me and Ligit uh, talking to each other every week so <laughs> I'm probably not there but you know some of the other active ones for sure um, so uh, thanks Laurie yeah thank yeah, you, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Laurie okay um, so I'll thank give you, you back I'll give you back six minutes of your time. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye.